Welcome to the Riveted Bracelet. I'm Chris Silva. Thank you for taking my class. Um, riveting is a great, great technique to learn. Um, it's very, um, it's something that you can use for a lot of things. It's actually one of my favorite metalworking techniques, and it's uh, definitely the beginning of my future projects, um, like my riveted rock band and some different um, riveted pendants that I do. After taking this class, you'll be inspired to come up with many of your own interesting techniques and projects. As with all the classes at Education, we recommend that you watch this class all the way through before you get started. There's a couple things that may not make sense as you go along, but if you watch it all the way through, all those pieces will fit together once you get started. So enjoy, and then we'll see you back at the end of class and start our project again. Okay, so for riveted bracelet, let's talk about the tools we're going to need. Uh, we actually will have, um, we'll start with the basics. For, um, with the round nose plier and a bent nose plier, which we'll mostly be using for doing our spirals. And then a heavy duty flush wire cutter um, that will cut a maximum of, or up to uh, like a 12 gauge wire flush. Okay, there are some additional tools we'll be needing to um, make the riveted bracelet. What I'm gonna start with is a bench block. Um, this is a stainless steel bench block, um, what you use for um, hammering, forging, and um, texturing metal. I have a riveting hammer. Um, this is the part that we're gonna be using to form the head or upsetting the wire to form a rivet. And then the face here is used also for forging or just changing the shape of metal, but really this is the part of the riveting hammer that splays the wire out so that it gives us a really nice solid head. Um, this is a screw down metal hole punch. It has two different handles. One is a black handle, which makes a large hole equivalent to a 10 gauge wire. And then it has a silver handle, which is um, a smaller hole, or it makes a smaller hole, the equivalent of a 14 gauge wire. And then we also will be using a wrap and tap plier. This is a medium sized wrap and tap plier. What we're gonna be using this for is for shaping um, our wire without creating any nicks or marring of the metal. Okay, I'd like to talk to you um, a little bit about the, the, these are metal hole punches. So this is a screw down metal hole punch that gives you two different sizes of, of holes. Um, pros and cons to working with a screw down hole punch is that you do get the option of um, two different size holes in one tool, but it's limiting because this makes a 14 gauge hole and this makes a 10 gauge hole, and they do tend to be pretty big. Um, and um, they also can go through something as thick as a penny. Um, usually you only want to use it on copper or sterling silver or very soft metals. You definitely wouldn't want to use it on brass or um, anything thicker than a penny because you can risk breaking the tips of um, the tips or the bits off of these tools. Um, so pros is that it, it, it's versatile, it can go through something the width of a penny, and it makes uh, two different sizes of holes. But when you meet, need to make something smaller, you need to make a smaller hole, you can't buy different bits and use the same base to make those. And actually, they don't make these with smaller punching holes. So that's why I have these tools here to explain to you a little bit about that. Now this tool here is just called a metal hole punch. And, or a hand a handheld uh, hole punch plier or what have you. But if you notice, it has just um, one little bit here. It punches the metal through on this side. If you look very uh, closely, you'll see a number one. And um, actually, it's on the other side, sorry. You'll see a number one right here. So um, these come in different numbers. So one is the equivalent to a get by the way, this makes a 16 gauge hole. Number one is a 16 gauge hole. Number two, it goes up from there. So I believe that this tool, they're handmade. It goes all the way to number um, four, which is about an eight gauge hole, equivalent to an eight gauge wire hole. So it goes from a really small to really large, but you only get one hole at a time or for each, I guess, you would have to buy every single tool to make every single type of wire or type of hole. So from the smallest to the largest, you'd have to buy a different tool for each one of those. Because of the way this tool is, um, 
angled. It's um, a hole punch which uses the force of your hand to punch through the object. Because of that, um, there's no leverage like, for example, this is a screw down, so you're screwing down as it punches through the metal. This one doesn't have that leverage, it just punches down with um, the use of your hands. And so it could only go through something as th um, thick as maybe a 22 gauge um, sheet diameter. So it wouldn't be able to go through a penny, it wouldn't be able to go through um, even a 20 gauge hole punch, maybe once or twice, but then it would eventually weaken the tip that makes the hole and then it would break off. So you definitely wanna use it um, only for working with smaller gauges. Now this again was a 16 gauge hole size or equivalent to a 16 gauge wire, which is smaller than 14. Now the blue handle is similar, only this makes an 18 gauge hole size and again has the same limitations. You don't wanna use it on anything thicker than a 22 gauge. Um, again, it should be through soft metals like sterling silver and copper and um, and these also come in different sizes, but you would have to buy each tool. Each tool would have its own size, so it's not multifunctional like this one is here. Okay, now I wanna talk about um, the different types of riveting hammers. Um, I predominantly use this riveting hammer. I, I like the, um, the length of the hammer, um, the size of the head, and I also like the width that we have here. I believe this is a one and a half inch um, head here. And that, that's referring to, I believe, the length. Not this, not I guess not this length, but I would say that I guess that's the width. And um, it gives me a nice even head, especially because I'm working with the thicker gauges of wire. I have used the smaller, the smaller one for working with, um, t for riveting thinner gauges of wire. And that one works really well. But this one, I it's to me, it's just more multi-purpose, more multifunctional, and um, I get a really good results every time with this one. Um, now, this I just wanted to show you this because this is also a riveting hammer. Um, it's you know basically has um, like a hammerhead look, um, but it has like a chrome plating. And what I notice is after I've riveted my piece. I want to get a smoother finish. I don't want any have. I don't want to have any ridges. I want to have it to be kind of like a mirror shine finish, and that's what I use this one for. Um, it's the equivalent equivalent of a chasing hammer, but in the shape of a rivet head, so or a riveting hammer head. So it's really a good tool to have. Um, uh, we will occasionally use a plastic uh, mallet. You can substitute it with a rawhide, rubber, or any type type of non. Um, non-metal um, hammer or mallet and that's just um, we will be using occasionally to kind of smooth out some of our spirals that we make um, because everything has to fit really smooth and even and tight so we can't no, nothing can have it, like any waves or or um, unevenness to it so we don't want to necessarily texture it but we do need to um, be able to, to hammer it down in order to smooth it out before we can go ahead and um, connect or join or rivet our spirals to our, our, um, our blanks. Let's start with the materials we'll need for the riveted bracelet. Let's start with our 18 gauge wire. 18 gauge wire will need about four to five feet of sterling silver soft 18 gauge wire. Um, we'll also be needing about six inches of 14 gauge um, sterling silver wire. This could be um, soft or half hard. Um, I would say half hard would probably work best, but you can definitely use soft. And then we'll only need really about anywhere from one and a half to two and a half inches of 12 gauge wire. And um, that could definitely be soft, not half hard. We'll be using this to make our clasp. The 14 gauge wire we'll be using for riveting. The 18 gauge wire again, we'll be do using for spiraling. Now we have a section or a variety of clasps here. I'm sorry, not clasps. We'll cut that out. So we have a variety of different types of blanks and sizes and shapes. We have some sterling silver ovals and rounds in a variety of sizes, even some scalloped ones. And then we have some copper ones over here. And this is um, a washer that's sitting over, a sterling silver washer sitting over copper that I thought we could make a cool project or a little design um, sample with that one. So let's get started. Okay, I just wanted to show you a um, finished 
finished sample, um, this bracelet measures um, about eight and a half inches, and there is seven um, coins in uh, this sample. Um, it's pretty long, um, so there's a number of things we can do. We can either lengthen the um, the pieces we'll, we'll use, which is a, we can go down to six coins instead of, or six blanks instead of seven, and then the connectors that we make, the spirals that link each piece in between, you'll notice they're all variants varying in size. So some of them are a little short or long, and so you'll see some interspersed with some long ones and some short ones here. So that plays a factor, a role in it as well. And then we end with the clasp that's gonna connect into this section over here. And um, most people make their clasp um, smaller, but if uh, yours is kind of in the middle, um, the clasp is actually shaped at the very end, so you can decide if you want to make it long or, or a little bit shorter. You can also adorn your bracelet with some beads. I've um, handmade the head pins, so I can have some chunkier pieces dangling off the heavy coins to kind of just bring it all together. And um, I did want to mention that these are actually some old coins from India. They're called Bhutan coins, B-U-T-A-N. And they don't make, um, I should say, obviously they're not made anymore because they're old, but they do make rep these, um, they do replicate them. They're sold um, in copper and I believe brass or something like that. But we're going to be replacing um, the coins with some blanks that we can texture, do some design stamps with, and then we can um, make this into a really cool connected bracelet. So the first thing I'd like to do is um, do some design work and texture. Um, since we're using some plain blank sheets, I'm gonna go ahead and do a little bit of texturing using a little bit of design stamp to embellish. Now all of this would have to be done before we start the riveting process. Otherwise, there's gonna be very little surface to work on and do design work and it would be a little um, difficult to work around the edges of wire. So it's better that we do all of this design work now and um, then we'll move on from there. Okay, so I thought I'd use some of these really cool new stamps that Lisa Kelly's got in from Education. She's got um, some of these that she designed herself. We've got a question mark, really cool question mark. We've got the plate, uh, Paisley, can't even, can't even say it, Paisley. And uh, we got a flower with a spiral center. I don't know if you can see that. And then, of course, the heart with a spiral inside the heart. So I'm just going to do a couple of design stamps on copper and silver and um, um, just get some really cool texture on our metal blanks before we even get started with the uh, riveting part of it. The other thing I do to do really cool texture on these metal blanks is using different types of hammers. So you've seen um, a regular ball peen hammer. This one has two different surfaces, so it makes a little bit larger um, peening action on one side and a little bit smaller on the other. And then riveting hammer actually gives you a really cool um, texture using not the face part of it, but rather the riveting hammer side of it. And I have this really cool smaller peen peening hammer, which gives you really small divots, and that also gives you some cool texture. So there's a couple of things that you can do for texture if you don't have any design stamps. So let me show you what you can do. Okay, we've actually went ahead and removed the base of the bench block and um, any type of cushion or metal um, fabric covering the table. And that is so that we get a better impression when we do this, um, do the hammering. So I'm going to go ahead and do a couple of more uh, stamping demos and show you the difference. I'm going to the flower uh, stamping that we did on using the rubber base and a um, fabric on the table um, didn't allow an even impression. So now I'm going to do it again without all those all the cushioning. Remember to hold um, the the um, stamp from the middle downwards, don't hold it too far up. It gives you better stability. And I, and I tap it and then strike it. So now I have a couple of um, 
stamping with the flower and I'm going to go ahead and try the paisley because 70s just needs to live on. So I'm going to go ahead and um, oxidize these and see how they came out. Remember using that Sharpie, this is just giving us an immediate, um, I guess, us being able to see our work right away without having to use a chemical at this point. This is just, I guess, the next best thing. Okay, so once um, I've used that marker, I'm just going to go ahead and try and polish off the surface so I can see the impression a little bit better. And this is a paisley um, sample, so it got a pretty good impression. You can see the really nice detail of the edging on on the actual paisley part. Okay, now remember when using design stamps, these are a hardened steel, so um, you do want to use a 16 ounce household hammer as opposed to any type of jewelry hammer. You don't want to ruin any of your jewelry hammers. So um, not only does a household hammer not ruin the face, but also the weight of the hammer helps you get an even strike or an even impression when you strike it. So these are a couple of the things that um, I've um, stamped and did some texture. So you see the question mark, the paisley, and then um, obviously we like the flowers with the spirals in the middle. And then this is just some peening texturing and then using a riveting hammer for texturing just to give it um, a little different, um, maybe edgy look. Um, most of these stamps, or I should say all of these stamps, you can find at Beejucation, and also there's a freebie on stamping, um, so if you wanted to get a little bit more um, information about um, stamping, don't forget to look at our freebie on Beejucation.com. Okay, I'd like to show you um, how to, um, we've just done stamping, I'd like to show you how to do different types of texturing, just with some simple household, or simple, um, chasing hammers and um, riveting hammers. These are going to give some really great um, impressions and texture that you're going to be able to do easily. Um, this is something a student taught me is when you're hammering so you don't risk hammering on your finger. Just use a pencil with a large eraser to hold it down. I'm actually going to use a face of a riveting hammer here and I'm going to go towards from the edges um, or from the middle to the edges and then I'm going to start hitting it at random and it gives kind of like a bamboo type um, impression. So I don't know if you can see it too well from there but you can see the little ridges that it's created and it gives a really cool finish. Now I'm going to show you how to do just some t small peening action using um, this is just a smaller version of a peening hammer with two different heads. So you can see here that you have really small little impressions, little divots. Now I'm going to use the larger size. and those divots are just a little bit bigger. So now I'm going to go ahead and um, use my marker to oxidize it quickly so you can really see the dimension and then we'll go from there. Okay so you can see a variation of um, the different using the different design stamps again the day um, the flower with a spiral the paisley the question mark and then you can see the really cool um, texture that I got from my riveting hammer um, that bamboo type um, strikes, long um, strikes there, and then using the small peen hammer, a larger peen hammer, and then you can see also that um, peening action on this side over here. So these are some of the pieces I'm going to go ahead and incorporate into the riveted bracelet that we're going to start up in just a minute. Okay, what I'd uh, like to show here is that the next step is um, preparing for the riveting. To prepare for the riveting I'm going to show you how to start making these spirals and I usually like to do like an assembly line so I'm going to make all my spirals that will connect so you need two spirals 
for every single blank except for the ends. The ends you're going to have um, a different type of hook and you're going to have end with a clasp, a handmade clasp that you're going to rivet directly onto your to your bracelet. So that last part of your your either coins or blanks are going to have two one's going to have end with two holes, one will end with one hole, but all of the in between so you're going to be making anywhere from 2 4 6 to um, 7 spirals that will connect all the pieces together. So that's what we're going to focus on next is making those spirals and then we'll move on to the riveting. Okay, so these are uh, the spirals that we're going to be forming. And um, in order to do that, we're going to be using um, about three inches for every spiral. So this is one um, long three inch section of 18 gauge soft wire. And we're going to be forming these spirals. And again, we're going to be using two for every blank except for the ends that will use a different spiral and a, and a handmade clasp. So right now I'm going to show you how to construct these. Now if you've made spirals before, um, it will be, um, I'm sure, somewhat easy. But these are going to be a little bit more specific as far as um, how we're going to start them. So I want you to really pay attention on how these are formed and why they're going to be formed this specific way. So um, let's get started. Okay, so um, we're going to be cutting our 18 gauge um, sterling silver soft wire into three inch increments. Um, what usually in class I ask you to cut that cut just one section at three inches, and then decide whether or not you'd want your spirals to be that long. And let me explain. You'll notice if you look closely that the this is the bale, so the spirals take about an inch each. And then the bales what takes up the other um, inch. Sometimes people don't want their bales to be that long. You can see these ones seem a little bit longer. And sometimes they want them to be considerably shorter. So this is a perfect example. This one has just a small little bale next to a long bale. Um, keeping that in mind, your first section will be cut at three inches. If you feel that that's too long, you don't like the look of this bale, then you can just shorten it maybe two and a half inches. I don't, I wouldn't go down to two inches. Again, a spiral takes an inch each, and if you want to have maybe a half an inch or three quarters of an inch to do the bale, that's fine. Okay, so the first one, we'll cut it at three inches. This wire here is our riveting wire. We're going to be riveting with 14 gauge wire. Now we're not going to use all six inches, or I guess in this case it's a little over four inches, but we're not going to use all four inches. It's just a really good working length um, in order for us to be able to manipulate for leverage. And um, it's a lot easier than working with really small pieces of wire. So again, uh, uh, maybe four to six inches of 14 gauge, that's a riveting wire and then three inches to start with for our um, 18 gauge soft wire. Now make sure that both ends are cut flush. Let me move this out of the way since we're, we're done with our ruler. But I want, want to make sure that both ends will be cut smooth or flush with no points or no angles. So even if you cut it flush, you just want to make sure it's not cut at an angle this way, but rather just straight up and down. I'm going to do the same thing with my riveting wire. My riveting wire again is 14 gauge sterling silver soft. In order to start our spiral, I make sure that I'm holding my wire flush in my tool. In other words, I don't want to have any wire sticking out at all. I want that wire to be completely flush in the tool. So if I run my finger across the top, I can barely feel the top of that wire. Also notice that I'm um, pretty close to the edge, almost an eighth of an inch in from the edge of my tool, my round nose tool. And I'm going to go ahead and start by, hold on, reposition it. I'm going to go ahead and start by rotating just a small section. So I'm pulling, pushing against my thumb. I'm pushing against my thumb as I'm rotating that wire. And what I'm going to show you is that I'm starting out with um, just a hook. And I, I really want to emphasize that it's not, um, there's no straight edges here. You can see that if I continue going, it's going to continue being rounded. It doesn't have a straight edge. And I'll go ahead and demo what, what it shouldn't look like and then what it should look like. So there's just a basic loop. And then if I were to do it with some wire sticking out on the other end, 
Then you'd see how this is more of a, it has like that straight edge here, more of a teardrop shape as opposed to a round shape. So it's really important that you not have this shape. So if that happens, don't start all over again. I want you to just take your flush wire cutters and cut just the flat part off. So I'm gonna start trimming off the wire where it's already rounded and then taking off the straight edge. Don't just come over here on the straight, don't just come over here on the straight edge and try to cut it there. I want you to cut it before. I want you to cut it before you get um, where it's actually curving. So you're almost pre-emptying it. So then you would have this little hook look and then continue that same um, in that same angle and then you're going to end up with a round um, or a basic loop, a round basic loop. Okay, so you notice that I've made both loops facing in the opposite direction. Now the next step is I'm going to take my 14 gauge wire and I have to fit it through these loops. As I fit it through these loops, I want to make sure that I'm like really forcing that wire in there and I don't want to see um, the wire being loose at all. So, so you could see how if I move this up on, it's actually good. You can see it kind of sliding down. So that's too loose. Even though it looks like it has a tight fit, it's still too loose. Now I'm going to try the other side. The other side actually isn't closed all the way. So I'm going to go ahead and tighten that up. So your first basic loop should be really tight or flush. So the, it go, the um, loop goes from end to the other side and there should be no gap in between. And then this one here needs to be a little bit tighter. So notice I'm using, I'm u and so it, it actually fits there on my round nose plier. I'm gonna go to the very tip of that round nose plier and then bring it in tighter from that point. Now it's not that I'm trying to disfigure the loop, it's that I'm trying to make the loop just a little bit smaller so that when I actually go ahead and put my 14 gauge wire through there, I'm forcing it, almost screwing it in there. So you can see it's really tight, it's not moving around, and I actually have to um, kind of force it onto the 14 gauge wire even just to slide it off. And now I'm going to go ahead and do the same thing to the other side, making sure that this is also just as tight and this is perfect. So the tighter the fit, the better. Okay, so basically we wanna get from this to this, a spiraled look. But the reason you want it to fit so tight from the get-go is because once we're actually gonna be riveting this spiral and there's gonna be a coin in between and it has to be extremely tight. It can't be loose falling off. It has to be um, tight, again, almost like you're screwing it in. So the tighter the fit, then the better the end result, your rivet, will come out awesome. Okay, so again, initially we want our spirals to be, or our basic loops to be um, just tight enough to fit a um, 14 gauge wire really tight. So what I'm showing you is that that's where it is on the tip of my tool, about an eighth of an inch in from the tip. And I'm gonna take that and do the same thing on the other side. And then what I'm gonna do is, perfect, what I'm gonna do is with my next pieces that I'm gonna be forming, um, my next, you know, because we're going to be doing an assembly line, so we're going to be doing this about six to seven times. So every time I start, I'm going to start on that same position on my round nose tool. So if you want to take a Sharpie and mark it, it just makes the process go much faster. Now, we're not done yet because e um, the next starts to spiraling. What's going to happen with the spiraling is the metal is going to expand. So before I start spiraling, I take my bent nose, and I'm gonna just apply just a little bit of pressure so it closes that loop even more. Then I'm gonna hold it in the crook or that curvature of my bent nose and I'm gonna start by rotating the wire around and I wanna do one complete turn and then I wanna go ahead and see if my riveting wire still fits through there because what's perfect, what's gonna happen is your wire is going to want to, or the basic loop will want to expand. Now I'm not going to do that little tuck with this one. I'm going to show you what happens if I just from that point go in and try to um, to rotate my spiral and then I go into and now you can see how it's kind of loose. It falls off. So it helps to make it tight initially 
And then before you get started with the spiraling, I want you to do this little step here. Don't worry about this wire getting um, a little messed up because we're just gonna spiral it back up. So I've tightened that loop up, made it almost made it almost too small so that my riveting wire probably is not gonna fit through there. I probably made it a little too small. So it is, it's a little too small. Before I unravel it again, I'm gonna use my round nose plier. And sometimes this allows me to stretch it out just enough to get my riveting wire through there. Now, if that happens, then I don't have to uncoil on my spiral, but um, it's actually fitting through, I think. <laughs> Bear with me. It's actually fitting through and perfect, it fits through. And the fact that it took me two or three tries to get it through there, I think we're good to go. Okay, so um, what we wanna get is from this S-shaped spiral to this, and what I call this is a paper clip spiral. You can see that that's where our blank is gonna fit in, and that's um, what we're gonna be forming with our round nose plier is the bail, the bail part of um, this connection. Okay, so I'm gonna put this down, and what I'm gonna do is show you that you want the spirals to be facing upwards, not you, but rather facing up or down towards the table. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna rotate this so you can see that as you're folding this, you I initially start out by folding it um, evenly at the same time, but once I get to this point, I can start to see if one's gonna be longer than the other. And I can see that the bottom one the one closest to me is gonna be a little longer. So instead of keeping um, the pressure on both, I'm actually gonna pull just the bottom one in a little bit. Now the long one's a little t um, longer, so I want to bring them both in so that they end up being um, level or even at this point. And then I'm gonna just bring them so they almost touch. Now I'm gonna go ahead and slide this off my round nose plier. You can see that this is the bail that I've, I'm forming. Now, one of the things I mentioned earlier was that you can decide if you want a long bail or a short bail. Okay, so what we wanna do is we wanna get from this spiral into making um, what I call a paperclip spiral. Um, I'll backtrack just a little bit to show you that um, three inches um, gave me a smaller head for a bail by doing two and a half spirals on both sides. So it gave me almost half an inch to do the bail here. Now when I um, wanted a little bit longer bail, I went ahead and went a little bit over, almost like three and a quarter um, inch section and did two and a half spirals on both sides. And it's giving me three quarters of an inch to do the bail as opposed to just half an inch to do the bail. So just letting you know that you can move those numbers around. You can start with three inches and get a smaller bail. If you want a longer bail, then just move it to three and, three and a fourth, three and a quarter inch section of wire. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you how, um, or I've already shown you how to fold it over so you get this paper clip effect now I wanna show you how to make it a little tighter so that it's gonna hold your blank smooth and tight, or it's gonna hold it smooth and tight. Okay, so I'm actually gonna hold the bale, not the inside of the bale, but rather the outside of the bale. So the whole length of that wire, I'm holding it, but if you look at it, it almost looks like it's, it's crooked. And that's okay, we just wanna hold the bale because what we're gonna do is holding, um, using our thumb and forefinger, on your non-dominant hand and your tool in your dominant hand. I'm gonna pinch these two together, pinch those two together as the tool holds the bail, and I'm gonna twist in opposite direction. So I'm gonna twist in opposite direction. So now look at that, it's gotten rid of the gap there. I'm gonna do it one more time. Again, to get rid of this gap and make it tighter, I'm going to hold the length of the section of my bail, pinch with my thumb and forefinger the spiral part, and then twist in opposite directions, and then it tightens that up. And I'll just do it one more time for good measure. Again, holding the bail, you actually can see how this is straight across, and this has like a little curve in it. So that curve is what you wanna hold, and then twist 
against each other. So I'm twisting in the opposite direction to close this gap here. Okay, so what ideally what we want is for that paper clip to sit onto our blank, shake it, it's not coming off, it's not only fitting snugly on my blank, let's grab one more so we can do it on the other side. So not only is it um, fitting snugly on our blank, this is what it's going to look like. You're going to be able to place it wherever wherever you want. And some sometimes students like to bring it way down so that most of the spirals on the blank and they have just a small little bale. But it's up to you. This can go all the way to the edge if you want so your bale can be a little bit longer. And then you'd want to position that wherever you'd want to put your blank. Okay, so there's a few steps that we need to do before we start the actual riveting. Um, what I want to mention is that um, if you look at this bracelet, um, you can see that these spirals are connected together, so there's no um, connecting after the point. So that being said, before we can start riveting, we're going to take these pieces off and then attach them to each other first. If I can do it, apparently I can't do it. Here we go. So they're just going to look like that. They're going to connect like that. Now we can go ahead and slide them back onto our pieces. And I stretched them out just a little bit here so they're not closing up. So I just need to um, close those little sections up again. Make them really, really nice and tight. And so now we're ready to go ahead and slide them back to their companions. Okay, now all of my designs are going to be on the front. So what I'm going to what I'm going to do first is I'm lining this up. I I know that I want my holes to be right here because I want these question marks to show up. So I'm going to turn this around. I'm going to take a Sharpie marker and mark on the back side where we're going to punch the holes. And then do the same thing with this side. Make sure that you have this lined up where you want it to be. And remember, if you want to make the bales a little bit smaller, you can actually bring the spirals in. That's not a big deal. So maybe we'll do that. Make the spirals go in just a little bit further. And then turn it around and go on the back side. It's not making a mark, so I'll switch out the marker and mark them on the back side again. Now once these are marked, we do slide off the paper clips, as I affectionately call them, and you can see my marks on the back. And I actually go ahead and take the larger part of the Sharpie and make these marks considerably larger, because now we're gonna go in and use our screw down metal hole punch plier or not plier, but our screw down metal hole punch. Okay, so now using my screw down hole punch, I'm going to go ahead and um, punch my holes. Now remember, this one has a 14 gauge hole and a 10 gauge hole. We are riveting with 14 gauge wire, so the hole has to be 14 gauge. Remember, everything has to fit tight and snug. So what I'm going to do, um, by marking these um, pretty wide, or a large circumference of that dot, it's gonna allow me to take my tool and center that tool right in the middle of that dot. So if I go all the way around, you can see that there's like a black line all the way around that tool, that part where it's going to go ahead and hole punch. Okay, so the nice thing about this tool is that it works with leverage. So I'm just holding the base here and I'm rotating the um, the screw down part of the, the punch. Now it's already punched through. I don't have to screw all the way down. What I notice what happens sometimes if you do that, it scrapes the surface of the blank. And so I don't usually go all the way down. I just go until it's, it punctures through and then I unscrew. Okay, so you can see one hole has been um, punched and now I'm gonna go ahead and make the other hole. Oh, and I was going to mention one thing about this tool. 
um, people always ask me, well, how do I know um, if I can use this for this coin or that coin? My rule of thumb is when you, uh, you're you at this point, you're getting ready to twist this. If you, You'll notice I have a little resistance, but it's not hard. It's just the resistance of puncturing through metal. But I've actually tried to go through things there. It's punctured all the way through. But I've actually tried to do this on coins like brass or something that was just a little bit too thick for this. And I'm sitting there like really trying to twist that tool and then my bits break off. So my rule of thumb with this tool is that if you are encountering any resistance where you really can't turn this knob and you have to use a tool to give you the leverage, then it's gonna break. So just stop and un undo it. Those you would definitely just need to drill out as opposed to using a handheld punch. Now notice I'm not grabbing my blank. It's just gonna fall off on its own. So it's gonna unscrew, it's gonna fall off on its own. And I like to show this part because people like to see what comes out of this hole punch. What happens to those little pieces? So if, there it is, there's one little piece right there. I actually have a friend who um, who uses these pieces, especially the sterling silver ones, and then she solders them onto um, blanks and creates really cool texture with them. So if you want, you can keep these little pieces for future use. This is where my holes have been punched. And then I'm gonna go ahead and slide where it's all gonna go through. Okay, so ideally I want to um, have something attached on this side. So let me go ahead and do that right now. Yes, Crisola struggles <laughs> sometimes. A lot of the times. It's really quite fun and aggravating at the same time. And um, in the new millennium, when I actually get this through there, <laughs> I will continue to the next step. Okay, so now my pieces are there. Again, that gap that I've created, I just need to go ahead and tighten that up. And ready to slide that puppy in there. Okay, so once I have that through, you can see how my holes of my spiral line up with the hole that's in the blank, and you can see through the back. Now, I'm ready to attach my riveting wire through all three pieces, the spiral, the blank, and the spiral. You can see I'm really screwing that in there. And at this point, it's not, it's not coming off. It's just tight on there. And that's exactly what you want. So if you notice at this point that your coin or blank is um, falling off, all your pieces are just falling off your riveting wire, chances are you've made your spirals too big. And so it really has nothing to do with the size of the hole that you've punched, it actually has to do with the size of the holes that are going through the spiral. So um, when you make, again, when you're making those spirals, it's really important that you take your time in doing those. What I wanna show you is that on this side, I'm putting my 14 gauge wire through there so you can see that it's not, the coin is not gonna hold it in, it's actually the spiral that holds it in. So again, just make sure that everything is done correctly before you move to the riveting step or the riveting process because this um, I like to do all of my spirals connect all of my pieces and then I'm able to rivet all my pieces in a row because once you get your rhythm in in um, in in riveting your pieces you don't want to lose that rhythm by going back and starting another spiral and then doing a rivet so if you do it as an assembly line you'll have more success so what we're focusing right now is um, how much riveting wire to use. The reason that's important, I'm gonna show you a couple of other things. The reason that's important is if you have just enough wire, you're gonna be forming these heads on both sides, okay? If you have, so this is just using a thicker wire to do the riveting, so it's a lot more substantial. But if you have too little wire, what you do is you actually form something that's called a disappearing rivet. So if I run my finger across, you don't feel or see the bump that you feel here or see. So you can see how it's raised up above it. So you can see if you look at this from the side, you don't actually see any wire or very little, if none at all, wire sticking out. So that's called a disappearing rivet. And that means that you didn't that you used just enough wire 
to form a head on both sides, but not enough to hold anything together. So this technically fills a hole like this, but it wouldn't hold anything to it. So what happens is if you have too much wire sticking out, the wire, instead of forming that head that I've just shown you on those other projects, instead of forming a head here and here, the wire that goes through the, the blank and then the spirals here, it starts to bow. And that's telling you there's too much wire, there's too much length. So instead of it being able to hit here and form a, like a, a nail head, the, the wire in the middle is just starting to bend. And once that happens, um, you have to start the process all over. Um, one thing is that the hole that you formed here is now has now been stretched out so you can't use 14 gauge wire to rivet through that anymore now you have to use 12 gauge or 10 gauge wire to do the riveting which means that you have to configure your spirals to fit a 10 gauge and then hole punch this now to a 10 gauge so then again now you're working with um, all your fittings being exactly the same size and also fitting tight so at this point in the game, it's important that you start with the exact amount of wire. And what is that? The exact amount of wire is one millimeter here and one millimeter there. So it's going to look like this. I'm going to start off by cutting this wire flush because it is pointy. And I'm going to give that a blunt cut. So there's a blunt cut. There's no point. I'm going to slide this back until it forms or gives me one millimeter in length. And now I'm gonna turn it around. Okay, hold. And, and now I'm gonna turn it around and I'm going to give myself one millimeter in length on this side. Now, I always say in my class that it's better to give you, yourself more wire because a lot of people are like, I, oh, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to cut um, too short or too long, but it's better to cut it too long because you can always shorten it from that point. If you cut it too short, you just have to start all over again. So at this point, I'm going to go ahead and cut it, and it's going to give me this much wire on both sides, one millimeter. Maybe this side is a tad bit long, but it will still work. Now, this is what you wouldn't want to do, and I'll show you what too long actually looks like. And I'll go ahead and do that on the other side. Again, lining up all the holes so you can see that the um, holes are lined up. It just makes it easier to thread. Again, cutting this flush or blunt. And I'll show you what too much wire looks like. Let me back this up just a little bit. So that's what too much wire would look like. Can you see the difference? So again, one millimeter is best on both sides. So again, if you cut it too long, don't worry about it. I'm just gonna slide this up a little bit and that's about one millimeter. And then I'm just gonna trim one side over here. And trim. Now, um, at this point, if you made it too short, I'd rather that you just go ahead and try again, cut, take that piece off, which would look like this. So I'm gonna say we've made it too short. So let me push this up a little bit and trim the top part. And this is what it looks like if it's too short, where you could see maybe a little head on the bottom, but hardly anything on top. So if I squeeze those together, you can see very little wire on top and bottom. So what I'd rather you do is just take that off altogether. How you would be able to take that off is just use your bent nose plier if you can and rotate that out of there. And then you would just start again. That's the riveting wire that I've taken out. Looks like a little current bead. So I would say that the most challenging part of this is making our spirals to be fit a 14 gauge hole tight and then also just giving yourself the right amount of riveting wire so it's not too much and not too little. Okay. And then one more time. One millimeter on this side. One mil millimeter on this side. 
and I usually eyeball it, but you can mark your wire if you want with the Sharpie. And I'm gonna say that this one's a little too long, so I can go ahead and trim that. So one of the things I wanted to mention is you can see that we're using very little wire to, to form the rivets. And I've asked you to start with um, about six inches of 14 gauge wire. So you can see that if we were working with smaller pieces of 14 gauge wire, it would really be hard to take that wire in and out through all the, um, going through the whole bracelet. So this is just a good working length. Um, if, you f if you've made a couple of these and you wanna work with less amount of wire, then that's fine too. But I think to start with, you want it to be as the least amount of frustration if you can, and then shorten up from there once you understand the whole process of riveting. So now let's get uh, to, the ri to the bench block and our riveting hammer, and you can see how it's gonna start to look in the, process, in the steps of riveting. When it comes to riveting, we actually have to hold our piece up at an angle so that it keeps the riveting wire an even amount of ri riveting wire on top and bottom. I'm gonna actually have Claudia zoom in so you can see what I'm talking about. So you can see that I should have an even amount of riveting wire on top and on the bottom. So this is either, you can see my finger on this side holding it level but not down at an angle. It should be level or almost, I almost hold it up like this so that when I strike, it's, it goes to the level position as opposed to holding it in a um, diagonal position, which would allow, the um, again, the riveting wire to come all the way to the top. We always wanna keep that wire centered. So I'm gonna go ahead and start. Um, and usually what I do is, in order to upset correctly, you wanna go ahead and hammer like this, going back and forth. So here's the top part of my wire, and it's hammering like this. And then I'm gonna rotate it and then hammer like this. And what that's going to do, it's, it's splaying or mushrooming out the wire evenly. So it's almost like rolling dough. When you roll dough, it stretches out this way and then you gotta do it this way. And you gotta, you know, so you gotta do like a cross section. So what that does is it evenly mushrooms out the wire. Now, I don't do front and back, front and back. I do the front first, and I give it a couple of good taps to start the forming of that head. Again, I'm holding the edge here level, if not up at an angle, and I'm gonna go ahead and start tapping with my riveting hammer, and I'm, I'm tapping quite firmly. I'm not just giving little taps. I'm actually tapping quite firmly. I'm gonna go ahead and stop at this point, and I'm gonna bring it up to you so you can see, so you can see that the head is starting to form. You can see like a little mushroom, mushrooming starting to happen there. So, and you can see um, the um, riveting hammer, also the lines of the riveting, riveting hammer. So you can see like a little lip forming. And now I'm gonna go ahead and do the cross section that I mentioned earlier. So once I, strike it in this direction. Now I'm gonna rotate it and then strike it in the opposite direction. So what I wanna do at this point is I wanna show you that it should have an even head being formed. Going all the way around you can see all that heads being formed all the way around that wire. So it looks like it's a little higher on this side than it is on this side. And that might just be um, the pressure that I'm putting more on one side than I am on the other. So that being said, um, I can go ahead and apply more pressure on that section. Before I do that, since my head is actually formed or starting to be formed on this side, I'm gonna actually rotate it or turn it over and start forming on the back side that hasn't been riveted at all. So it's still just flat. So one of the things people ask me, well, when you're riveting the side that, um, that I've just riveted, does it rivet the other side as well? And it doesn't. What it does do is it smooths out this side, but it's not forming or um, splaying the metal now. It's not stretching it out. It's just smoothing out the surface of it, but it's definitely not riveting it. The only thing that can create the splaying or the mushroom effect of wire is this type of hammer, like a hammerhead or a forging hammer. Okay, so now I'm gonna go ahead and do the back side of it. And notice that I'm actually 
pushing, once you're on the back side, it's okay to push up because we've already formed the head on this side. So whatever wire is left, we can use to form on the back side of it. So now I'm going to go ahead and start tapping. And at this point, you're going to notice that it's going to start getting a little tighter. It's not tight yet, but it's going to start getting a little tighter. When it starts getting tight, I want you to keep in mind that this is as your hammering metal moves. You want this spiral to not be like this. This is no longer moving. It doesn't um, swivel or pivot. And that's what happens when you rivet wire to wire. It's just tight. So what you want to avoid at this point is once you get to a point where it's too tight and this is off to the side, say like at an angle this way as opposed to straight up and down there, you want to um, keep that in mind as you're doing the back side and you're getting tighter and tighter. Okay, now I'm going to test it. It's getting just a little tighter. You can see I'm kind of angling it any which way I can so I get that head formed evenly all the way around. Again, making sure that you're doing it in a cross section. Now I'm going to go ahead and stop just for a minute. I want you to see that on this side here, the head is already formed. You can see that little head being formed on this side. This is the back side. And you can see the head being formed there. It's kind of um, splayed out this way. And this is a side that we initially worked on. So now I'm going to go ahead and lower that side. So what I'm going to do is I'm just doing the finishing touches. This is actually still really um, loose, which is telling me that my rivet head or my rivet actually didn't work. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how to cut that off. I actually go underneath my spiral, which means I'm going to lose that spiral. And if you could, can see it that way, I actually go underneath that spiral and then cut just one side of that rivet head off and all prevent that from flying and hitting Claudia. Let's see if this side will work for me. Remember holding this up at an angle is important. You don't want all the wire to come to the top. So I'm holding this level. So what I want, want to show you is um, I can rotate it all the way around and you can see a head is starting to form on that wire. See how it's starting to um, get thicker on the top and it's thinner underneath it. Keeping in mind that this is already locked into place, now I don't have to worry about this moving around, the bale moving around and ending up over here. So now I can actually go ahead and push this all the way down because I all the wire that's left over that gets pushed to the top is what I have left to do my riveting, um, my rivet head on this side. I'm going to go ahead and hold it with the bail instead. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is show you from the top, you can see that head has been formed, and this is the other side. Now I can actually go ahead and use either a chasing hammer or a, a plenishing hammer, and what that's going to do is it's going to smooth it out so it's really clean and polished looking. And so I don't just hit it straight up and down, I actually hit it and um, splay it out using my hammer. I'll do that to both sides. So I run my fingers across, and this actually came out to be a little bit more of a, of a disappearing rivet, but I'm actually putting a lot of pressure on this, and it's the rivet heads are not popping off. So that should be considered a good rivet. Now I'm going to do one more. 
Okay, so that's that uh, bale that was already attached to this. I went ahead and used that to attach my other blank. And I'm getting ready to rivet that, or um, I guess um, cut that wire in order to get it riveted on this side. Um, again, measuring one millimeter on this side and then one millimeter on the other side. And then again, cutting that flush or blunt. Before I rivet this, I just wanna show you, see how they look kinda cockeyed? They're not really smooth and, and even. I just wanna show you that at the end, our bracelet, once everything's connected together, we actually go in there and kinda twist. You can see how this bale is a little twisted. We do that by hand at the very end so that it lays smooth and even without it being cockeyed. So I'm just letting you know that that is something um, that can be taken care of at the very end. And you can actually see how it's kind of twisted just a little bit so that they all lay smooth and even, okay? So let me go ahead and move on to um, connecting these. So now we'll have two links connected together and therefore making them components to, to complete a bracelet. Now remember holding, in order to rivet this, you wanna make sure that you're holding the blink at an angle. I'm just making sure that my riveting wire is smooth. I'm gonna trim it just a little bit. Okay, so I'm gonna start by holding the bail part and then hammering it and then turning it around. So remember holding this at an angle, I've kind of lifted, you can see how it's not completely on top of the bench block, but rather on top, kind of angled on top to the side so you see a little bit of distance in between there. And then tap, tap, tap. And then I wanna rotate it so that it's going to be uh, mushrooming out or splaying out evenly. And now I'm gonna go ahead and show you again what that looks like. If you look at it closely, it's forming a little head, okay? And sometimes you think, wow, um, that rivet doesn't look that big, but it actually it's the thicker the, thicker the wire you use for riveting, then the more pronounced or the, the bigger that head's going to be. So we're only using 14 gauge for riveting. The thicker you go, the bigger the head will form. And some people think, well, if I just put more, leave more wire, that's gonna give me more room to do a bigger head, but that's not the case. Uh, again, you wanna make sure that this is gonna be, is not too tight. You can move it around so that it's going to be centered and that looks pretty centered to me. So now I'm gonna do the back side. You can see how much wire I have left to do on the back to form a head there. Okay, so now I'm gonna go ahead and bring this Close so you can see that the head has been formed there and it's been formed there. Now this one is actually not as smooth as this one. It's not even so you can see it raised above the spiral. And some people like that look because they want to see the head but if you want it to be even cleaner or smoother or a little bit more polished then again you can use a chasing hammer or a ball peen hammer um, to smooth that out. Now again I don't, I don't usually tap straight up and down, but you can. I like to s kind of s stretch out the look of that head. And I do that on both sides. So now I'm gonna go ahead and show you what that looks like. So now you can see just a little bit of head there and there. But when you look at it head on, it just looks really smooth and clean. You can always um, also oxidize this bracelet when it's done and you can just hand polish because you can really see the spiral um, when it's oxidized as well. Okay, so now that these two pieces are connected, I just go in there and I'm pushing against themselves. And so you can see that little twist it forms. And now it's gonna lay, not cockeyed, but just straight, smooth and even. So there's the start of the bracelet.
Okay, so this is the bracelet being built. And what I wanted to go over is really just that we are making the spirals first so that we're connecting them. And then I'm gonna go ahead and pull this apart to show you that um, these are just you know pieces that we've connected. So the spirals have been made, they've been connected. Now we've attached them to the blank position where we want that spiral to be, whether if you wanted those centered, if you want that spiral to go further in so your bail could be shorter or longer. And then we're ready to um, take our Sharpie marker and then make the marks. So again, making our spirals, connecting them, attaching them to our blanks, making the marks. We wanna do that all the way through to, on every single blank and then we're gonna hole punch all of them and then we're ready to do riveting. And then once once you're done with that, actually the next step I'm gonna show you is how to do the clasp on the end and the or the hook on the end and the eye on the opposite end so you can see what that's gonna, how that comes together at the very end. Okay, we have a little sampling of um, what the bracelet is coming out to look like. Um, what's next is we're gonna be doing a hook and eye type closure. It's gonna look like this. So you're gonna be learning one, how to make the clasp, rivet the clasp, and then you're also gonna be learning a, a different type of spiraling connection. Um, one of the reasons I decided to end it in this manner as opposed to ending it and say something like this, which is the paper clip style, is because when it's, it sits, it, it just didn't look right sitting in that same direction. It actually looked more appealing and it always didn't, it didn't always sit just right. Whereas in this um, kind of loop or hook and eye section, it just laid a lot better and then it looked more finished and more polished. So we're gonna be, again, doing the clasp and then an, a different type of eye closure with the spiraling effect. Okay, so I've decided I'm gonna have my eye on this side of my, of my bracelet and then I'm gonna do my clasp or hook on this side. So let's start off with the spiral, um, continue with the spiral, which will be the eye part of the clasp and then we'll move on to the clasp. Okay, so we're gonna start with um, about three and a half inches of the 18 gauge wire to do this connection. So here's my 18 gauge wire. We will still be riveting with the 14 gauge wire. Now, because we're gonna have um, two eyes as opposed to just one, we're, that means we're gonna make our spiral first. We're gonna go ahead and lay it on top. We're gonna mark where we need to punch the holes. And then we're going to go ahead and connect that. Now, because in order to rivet it, we need two holes punched. We'll, we'll try and center that with this so that this is kind of meeting up in the center, just kind of just how this one is. We're actually gonna be using two riveting wires. So you, if you want, at this point, you can cut your 14 gauge wire in half and then you'll have two sections. So let's start off by making the spiral first and then we'll move on to the next step. Okay, so I'm just gonna start with my um, three and a half inches of 18 gauge wire. I'm gonna cut that flush on both sides. This one's already cut flush. And then I'm going to make my loops. Remember, uh, making them the same way where our loops are going to be made where it fits a 14 gauge wire completely flush or um, completely tight. So the only difference is both loops will be, will be facing in the same direction. And so this, um, we'll start with our first basic loop on this side. and then do the other side as well. Okay, so now I have two eyes and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just tighten this up just a little bit. Again, just bringing this down just a little bit before I measure it with my 14 gauge wire because I know I made it just a little bit too big. Now I'm gonna go ahead and thread my 14 gauge wire through that loop and as long as it's really, really tight, then I can move on to the next step. And ide ideally we want it to be tight. We're almost screwing the, in the wire. We don't want it to be where um, the wire is um, can be placed in there easily. 
we want to actually work hard for this step. What happened was when I went ahead and tried to insert my 14 gauge wire in the loops, it opened it up a little bit. So I've just closed that shut before I start the spiraling. So now I'm going to just spiral. And remember, I'm just going to do like one turn or a half a turn and making sure my 14 gauge wire still fits in there tight. Do the same thing with this side. And then again, before I continue the, to finish the spiral, making sure that the 14 gauge fits in there tight. Remember, we want to do one, two and a half spirals, but you, for this look, you can do more. This was about two and a half, but you can do more. If you do more, you'll just have less of a bale here. If you do um, just the right amount, then you'll have, or if you do just two and a half, then you'll have quite a large bale. I like the look of that. I think it's more of a preference of what you you want. If you want to do um, something a little chunkier, um, it definitely looks good when it's really has a long bail. Um, I believe I did one, two and a half on this side. This is one, two, just barely two. So I'm gonna go ahead and make this spiral just a little bit bigger. So now it looks like this. And then at this point, this is where I use the wrap and tap. The wrap and tap, for some reason, I can't do this with um, a round nose plier because the diameter of the round nose plier isn't large enough. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you by sliding this in that this is actually formed on the second tier, not the first tier. So if this um, blank wasn't in the way, you'd uh, there it goes. You'd be able to see how big I, I was able to make it on that second tier. Now, excuse me real quick while I slide that off. Now, if you're doing something a little smaller, this is done on the first tier. It's not going to let me get it in there because of the distance there, but this was actually formed probably on the second tier as well. But basically, we're not using our round nose plier to fold this over. We're using our wrap and tap plier. I like the look of the second tier. So just by placing it on the second tier, I'm going to bring these down a little at a time. Hey, look, there's a little girl with little curly hair. And we're going to bring these down so that they end up being centered. Now, what, how I get this really cool um, loop where it kind of tapers in comes close is at this point I actually bring my spiral and I overlap them a little bit and do that on top and I do that on bottom and then when I pull this off I've got that really cool curvature right there. Now if I bring up my blank that I'm actually going to lay this on this is how it's going to look like this. Um, now I, I can position, if I don't want my bale to be sticking out that far, or if I do, then you can position it at anywhere you want to on this blank, as long as there's room for that clasp to fit. So another thing too is sometimes what I notice for, with, um, students is, um, when they go to try it on at this point, I'm going to go ahead and just put this on really quick so I can explain to you what I'm talking about. Sometimes you need a little bit of extra um, length, almost like a toggle. You need a little bit of slack. Oops. Almost like a toggle. You need a little bit of slack in order to hook that in on the other side. So sometimes it helps to have that hook um, be or not hook, but the eye be a little bit longer in order to accommodate that extra slack. So just keep that in mind. Um, this can actually be the sizing process for your wrist as well when you're um, putting into account the clasp part of your bracelet design. Okay, so at this point, mark where I want to place this. Go ahead and grab your Sharpie, make your markings. And on this side, I'm not doing it over here. Actually, I guess I can do it on the back side because I can still see that I want it, want it centered 
with the, um, the spiral on this side. So in other words, I don't want it off to the side. I want it centered so that it's straight across. So at this point, I'm going to go ahead and just do some sort of marking and then remeasure it to make sure that's where I want it to be. Now, this is actually was a little bit difficult. If I don't know if you can see that, but you can see how it kind of the um, the spiral doesn't. This side lays a little bit flusher, but this one's kind of sticking out. So this would be a good time to just using your plastic or a hide mallet and give it a few taps and turn it over and give it a few taps because ideally you want that to lay completely flush next to your anvil. Now the reason I don't use a metal like a chasing hammer to do that is because metal expands metal so I don't want to expand the uh, the um, holes or the the loops um, because then it won't rivet correctly so I just want to be able to tap it down the texture actually comes afterwards after it's been riveted onto the blank so right now we're just focusing on making it smooth so that it's going to lay right on here just even so I've got, gone ahead and marked my blank. Now I'm realigning my holes with that blank. And it looks pretty centered, so I'm happy with where the, those markings are. When I lined it up, you can see that my marking, my black marking is there, but on this side, it's not marked. The mark is actually on the outside. So right there, you can see there's a black dot on the inside, but on this side, it's there's no marking. So I marked that incorrectly. So I'm gonna go ahead so I'm going to go ahead and mark it with my Sharpie so you can see that's where that hole um, sh should line up with this spiral. Now the reason I'm mentioning that is because these are just, this was the original marking here. This is the first one and the second one. This is the first one and this is the second one. That's what lines up with the spiral here. Now. Because we don't have the tension or the resistance that we need that we get with the paper clip, for example, with this, it sits on, I guess not that one. So with this, it actually sits on there. So there's tension. The clip or a paper clip is holding onto itself. We don't need to hold it. But when it comes to this, there's nothing holding onto it, so it's gonna fall off when we go to rivet it. So what I do to give me the, the proper tension is, this is these are the markings that we've made. They line up with those large dots. What I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna hole punch just a hair in from those markings. And what that's gonna do is it's going to bring these closer together so that when it gets attached with the riveting wire, the tension or the resistance is going to hold the rivet wire and the tension is going to hold this spiral to this coin if everything is done correctly. Okay, so now we're ready to mar do our marking. So using our Sharpie marker, I'm actually going to try and use um, one that has a finer point so I can get into those loops. Again, making sure that this is centered with the spiral above it. So holding that in place, I'm gonna go ahead and start by marking it on both sides. Now these are the markings it made. Where was that one right there and then that one right there. So I'm gonna line that one up with that mark and I want to make sure that this one lines up with that mark. And it does. So they're both lining up with their mark. Okay, so now if I take it off, these are the markings that I get. So let me make those markings a little bit bigger so you can see where they are. So that's where my markings are that are even with the spiral. Okay, so you can see I line them up in the black. You can see the black in those, in the inside those loops. You can see them line up with the black marker. Okay, so I'm trying to show you how to get the tension that you would need that you get um, from having that paper clip. 
and how I get that tension is that after I've lined up my holes, so these markings line up with these holes, I'm actually going to make um, the the um, the dots on the outside of that so that it's going to be hole punched, not where it's lined up, but rather on the outside. Okay, so notice that there's two dots side by side. I want to go ahead and hole punch. Um, so the first dots, or I should say the dots on the inside are the ones that line up with the spiral. We want to hole punch on the outside of those dots. So either in between the two dots or closer to the, the um, dot on the outside. Now what, that's, what that is going to do, it's going to stretch out our spiral and then that's going to give us the tension we need so that it, the spiral sits on top of the blank and that's, it's going to sit on there without moving around or being flimsy. So that's going to make the riveting process much, much easier. So let me go ahead and get moving. Um, again, I'm going to be hole punching on the outside of those um, markings that line up with the spiral. So don't forget, you want to use a silver handled side because that, again, makes a 14 gauge hole, which is what we're using to rivet is 14 gauge wire. There's one hole there's one hole made right there. I actually went ahead and lined it up with the, the outside dot rather than going in between those two dots. Now once those dots are, or once those holes are punched, I'll go ahead and put it together and I think it'll make a little more sense after you see it, after you see um, the next step. Okay, so now my two holes are punched. I've cut my riveting wire in half, so now I have two pieces of riveting wire. What I'm going to do is I'm going to attach one riveting wire to this side. First let me attach it to one side of the spirals. And then now I'm going to attach it to the blank. Okay, so there's one. And now I'm going to do the other side. So if you look at this closely, you can see that the hole is way down over here. So I'm actually going to, I'm actually, you can see I'm actually stretching out that spiral so that I can reach that other hole. Okay, so what this has done is it's um, stretched these out, the spiral. So instead of them being close together like that, it's stretched them out. If you want them close together, you can still do that. But what I've accomplished, but what I've accomplished by stretching out these spirals is that it's no longer flimsy. So right now it has the, um, the length of um, riveting wires and we're gonna be cutting those off. We're just gonna have two short riveting wires left in there. If those riveting wires were loose because let's say our initial spirals weren't tight enough to um, hold the riveting wire through there, then this right here would just keep falling out and then you, it would be very difficult to rivet. Okay, so um, I'm showing you that we have about one millimeter of wire. This one's a little bit longer, just a tad bit longer, but we have a millimeter of wire sticking out on this side. Now before we cut the other side, notice how this wire keeps, or the spiral keeps pushing out if you don't take that into account when you make your one millimeter um, section on this side, it's actually going to be longer because you're not taking into account that this needs to be pushed closer together. So make sure that if you um, have any gaps between your spiral and your blank, that that's going to make your riveting wire longer because you're cutting on the outside of that spiral. Now I've had students ask me, well, why don't we just do one side at a time? For example, why don't I just, why is this wire here? Why don't I just do this side, rivet this piece shut, and then I can do this side and then rivet that piece shut? Well, this is a problem. Um, if I were to just do one side at a time, as you're riveting, this wire's moving back and forth like this. And it's almost like this. It's just loose, it's flopping in the wind, it's moving around. Um, and what's happened to me in the past is I've riveted this part shut and this part is sticking all the way out here and now I can't move it down to rivet the other side. So I've just um, ruined my spiral because by bringing this arm down, it opens up right here because it doesn't pivot where it's been riveted. So it's just easier and more effective 
to have both pieces done at the same time and um, once uh, once you do it you'll see what I'm talking about. And now I'm just ready to measure my one millimeter um, riveting wire on both sides, trim, and then I just double check to make sure that I have an even amount of wire on both sides and it's not too long. It might be a little bit long, I'll double check that in just a minute. Same thing with this one. This one I need to pull it out just a little bit more. And so I have about one millimeter and now, and notice I'm actually holding the spiral down with the blank so that I get an accurate reading so I don't cut it too long. So that's about one millimeter on both sides. So you can see that this one's longer than the other one, especially after I bring push down on that spiral. So I'm just gonna trim this one a little bit and then we'll start the riveting process. Okay, um, we've changed the angle of the camera so that you can see clearly what I'm doing here. This is, um, we're now doing the eye part of the clasp. Um, what I'm going to be doing is actually the back part of the hook or the back part of the eye clasp. This is the front part. So again, I have an even amount of wire on both sides. So my um, riveting wire is on both inside both holes. I'm going to go ahead by tapping. So I'm going to do one and then do the other. And now I'm going to do the other or not the other side, but the other rivet. And now I'm going to rotate. I want to stop because I want to show you how the heads are forming. So you can see the heads are forming quite nicely. So now I'm going to turn it around and I'm going to push down where the rivets can push up so you can see now the wires coming back to the to the top. So I'm going to go ahead and work on this part and then uh, now I'm going to go ahead and rivet the other the top side of the um I part of the clasp. So I'm not done yet, but I just want to show you. You can see the heads formed on the back side. Those are formed really nice. And on the front, the front side, the heads are almost completely formed. I can actually go ahead and lay this directly on the, on the block now. It doesn't have to be held up high because the heads have already been formed. So you'll see me slip and not hit the root. You'll actually see me hit the spiral and that's okay. That's just the whole handmade look of jewelry. Now I'm happy with the rivet heads. I can see that they've actually formed quite nicely and I'm going to go ahead and go back and smooth them out. And then do the same thing to the front. Okay, so now we're going to talk about um, the construction of the clasp. I just want to kind of do an overview. What we're going to start out um, doing is we're going to use 12 gauge wire for make the construction of the clasp. And the reason for that is this part of the wire, you can see how it's kind of um, splayed out in this direction. You can see how it's splayed out in this direction, almost like a paddle and why it has to be 12 gauges, we have to splay it out wide enough to make a 14 gauge hole through that. And then sometimes I just file the edges so it's smooth. 
The other thing I want to talk about is the length of the clasp. So how much wire you start with really depends on you. I would say that for this style clasp or this size of a clasp, it's about anywhere from an inch to um, an inch and a quarter length of wire. The reason for that is when you splay the metal, you know, to get the um, that little paddle shape to to uh, in order to hole punch, that stretches the end out here. We're also gonna hammer the other side of the wire so that stretches it out a little bit more. I don't generally make, make, generally make my clasps too long for a bracelet, but if it were for a necklace or another handmade project, you can definitely make them bigger. And that's why I have this one here. This is two and a half, maybe two and three quarters of an inch length of 12 gauge wire. and. This one I actually use for a picture hanger. I just not um, actually drill a nail through there and I actually hang things with ribbons or what have you. And so that's another design option. But um, I just really wanted to pinpoint the, the clasp that you can start anywhere with anywhere from an inch of wire all the way to almost three inches of wire depending on the length of the clasp that you want. Okay, now let's get started in making the clasp. You will need approximately anywhere from an inch to an inch and a half. So I'll go ahead and trim this. Anywhere from an inch to an inch and a half of wire. Nothing longer than that for a bracelet. And I'll just go ahead and show you. This is a bracelet that we've made. It just comes out just a little bit and we want it to be small. Usually what I do is if I find a clasp that I like, I measure it on my ruler. This measures a little bit over and a half an inch. So you double that and add a little bit more because of the curve. That started out at about an inch and a half. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and start with the construction. Using 12 gauge wire, anywhere from an, an inch to an inch and a half of wire, you wanna cut both sides flush. There's that word flush. We never want pointy wire. So you have an inch and a half of wire. I know it looks very, very little, but that's all you need. I'm gonna start by splaying both ends. I'm gonna splay this end out to form a paddle shape. I need that to be wide enough in order to, mar to make a marking to make a 14 gauge hole. Here I go. Now one of the things I talk about whenever I do any type of hammering with metal or forging or changing the shape, especially when you flatten wire, I always flatten the wire where it has a really clean, even smooth finish. But when you turn it on its side, you don't want it to be paper thin. You still wanna see rounded edges. The reason for that is if, if you make this completely paper thin, it's too brittle. If you go to hole punch it, it's just gonna snap right off. So again, you just want to make this wide enough to make a 14 gauge hole, and then you still want the edges here to be rounded. Okay, after I've hammered it, I usually tend to file these edges smooth so that they're, um, there's no burr and it's just really clean and polished. Okay, so all I'm gonna do is just smooth this out. It's really sharp and it has a couple of burrs on there. So what I usually do is I use a medium file. You can also use a fine file. Um, medium files, are I would say um, pretty good because they still shape and they still smooth out. Fine files don't really shape, they just smooth out any burrs. Coarse files only shape. So you wanna make sure that you um, have a variety of files if you like to do a lot of metal work. So all I'm going to do is just using the corner of this, I'm actually taking my file and just shaping it in the direction I want. I don't know if you can hear the noise it's making it's actually grinding. Now if you just hear this, that's not really doing anything. If you hear maybe some ear piercing noises, then you're actually making a dent on what you're trying to do. So you just wanna make sure that you put some muscle into it. It helps to work on something that gives you height. So if you're going down, you're not immediately hitting your work surface. And then also um, it gives, this is like a non-sliding surface so that you're not sitting there struggling and holding your piece and slip, slip it and sliding. So this is just the best of both worlds here. So it gives you height and a non-sliding surface. Okay, so that's pretty much what I wanted. I wanted to shape it and smooth it out 
and then the rounded section, by the way, I've used the flat part of my file. This is a half round file. I've used a half round file for this. The flat part of it is what I used to shape and smooth out. And then the rounded part, actually I use that. I'll kind of tilt my wire at an angle so you can see. I, I just use it on the very end. So when you file like this, it leaves little burrs. So the metal comes up this way and that way. And what this does is it grabs those burrs without ruining the surface of the metal. And that's really all you want is to grab those little burrs. So I do that on front and back and it's done. So now we're ready to move on to the next step, which is marking for the hole and then riveting that part. So the next step is just taking a Sharpie, making a generous mark. The mark looks a little off-centered, so when I make my hole, I usually want that hole to be, or that marking to be centered so that it gives me a good, um, a good working area. So when I go ahead and hole punch, I know what I'm looking at. Since I know my marker is a little off-centered, I'll make my hole punch a little off-centered. Okay, so once I have it marked. I just make sure that it's even on all, or it's um, centered all the way around. It's not too close to any edges. You don't want to go through all that hard work and then realize that you've punched it off center. Then you have to start that whole process, and then you have to start that whole process all over again. So there's my hole punched. It's nice and smooth. The other thing that I wanted to mention is we're actually going to do the hook part as well, which is going to look something like this. So if you look at this closely, you'll see that it's been um, forged or just smoothed out just a little bit. So it's not just a round blunt end, but rather it um, has just a little bit. It's not fl completely flat, but it's just been hammered just a little bit. And the reason I only do just a little bit is because I don't want to work hard on this wire any more than I have to. So all I've done is hammer just a little bit. You can see how it's just flattened just a little bit. And you can see a couple little bursts. So I'll go ahead and um, be anal and use my file to smooth that out. That'll be really quick. And all I want, want is really just to get a smoother shape And then you can see it has gave me a little bit better shape. I'll go ahead and make that a little bit nicer. I'll just bring it up a little closer so you can see the detail. So it's just got a little hammered end right there and then I filed out the edges so it was a little rounded, looked a little cleaner. Now I just wanna show you what this is gonna be attached to and actually we're gonna be riveting that as well. So it's gonna be attached to this. So our clasp is going to be riveted onto this. Now it's actually going to be riveted on the back side and then the hook is going to come out and over. So you want to avoid or you want to make sure that when you do this step, and this is what I'm talking about. This is the back part of the clasp. This is the front part of the clasp. Since this is the front part, this is going to be shown on the front part. It's not, you don't want it to come around to the back side. So that's going to look like this and this will be the back. Okay, now um, on this one, if you forget what's happened to me before, because I'm so into what I'm doing, is that I actually, when I riveted my clasp, I went ahead and um, looped it in the same direction as a rivet, so the back side looks plain like that. I didn't like it. To me, it just didn't look finished and polished in this direction. I actually preferred it being riveted on the back and then coming up to the top. I think it's a much cleaner and more professional or polished look. So keeping that in mind, we're actually gonna make our hole punched on the top because we wanna make sure that um, we actually have more guidance here because we have our decoration on the front. So we'll go ahead and mark it there, again being centered, again being centered with the spiral here. So once that's made, that marking's made, we're gonna hole punch it and then we're gonna go ahead and rivet that, that, uh, that part of the clasp down. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so um, now I'm showing you how this is gonna look. It's gonna be connected like this. Now this will be flimsy. See how the clasp moves around? Um, this is all tight, but once we actually make this rivet wire short, it's, it's gonna wanna fall out. So right now what I wanna focus on is just cutting this side flush and then measuring it so it only has one millimeter sticking out on one side. So it's gonna look like this maybe a little bit more. And now we're gonna do the other side. <laughs> you can see that this one's a little, a little challenging, but it can be done. So there's my one millimeter on that side. Now I'm gonna do the other side. And that one's a little too long. We'll go in just a little bit. Now you can see that looks pretty good. So now I'm gonna go ahead and Cut that. I notice that I'm trying to keep it all together. I'm trying to hold it there because once I let go, that little piece of wire is going to want to fall out. Now remember, this is the front part of my clasp, so I'm riveting the wire on the back side. Okay, so that's actually the part I want to rivet first. So remember keeping this elevated so that it's not sitting flush on the bench block, otherwise, all the wire will come to the top. And then we're going to go ahead and rivet or start to rivet this one side. Keep in mind too that this is, oh, it's already, it's already tight, doesn't wanna move. So keep in mind that um, that happens very quickly. So if you're riveting and this is all over here, it's gonna be really hard to move this wire over. So make sure that you keep this straight. So it's already, it's already I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna come up really close. You can see how it's already formed that rivet head. So I'm pretty much done on that side. Now I'm gonna do this side. This side has a quite a bit of wire left. So I'm gonna, since there's nothing on this side that needs to be riveted flat on that side, I'm gonna trim that head, that wire just a little bit. Okay, so since I'm almost done with the back side, I, I see quite a bit of wire on top. So I'm gonna trim that just a little bit before I start the riveting on that side. So I've just trimmed off just a little bit. Okay, so now I'm gonna go ahead and rivet the top side. Now this nut can be held down because I have my head formed on the other side. And then don't forget to rivet and turn and rivet. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop and show you that head, how it's forming. It's forming really nice and even. Okay, so now I'm gonna go ahead and finish. I'm gonna turn it around and look at that for good measure. I'm actually gonna go ahead and switch hammers. At this point, you can use a chasing hammer or just um, a plenishing hammer, something that would smooth it out. And what that does is it gives you a really clean surface. You can see it almost looks like a really shiny button. Do the same thing to this side. Now this side, I don't have to, but I want to just to make it even with the other side. See how it's a raised rivet? It actually looks cool, but it's kind of sharp. The edges get really sharp. So I like to make the, I like to um, hammer those a little bit smoother to the surface so that they don't snag on anything. And then I run my finger across to make sure that um, it's not s sharp, but there's still height to it. So I'll go ahead and rotate. So you can see there's still some height to that rivet. Okay, so that's pretty much it. Um, now I'm gonna show you how to shape this into a hook. Okay, so I like to use my wrap and tap plier. The reason for that is this has a nylon sleeve that protects my wire from being marred because this is a 12 gauge wire. It's already been work hardened on both ends. So it's gonna be pretty hard to to turn even if you are used to working with thicker gauges of wire. So again, using the wrap and tap just um, makes it less of a, a problem of making any marks if you were to say you were using a round nose plier. So what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna start shaping it with my finger first, and I can actually see, hold on, let me position this so you can see what I'm talking about. This is, I'm using the first tier, by the way, to shape this. Um, I can tell that as this is coming and I bring them both together, 
it's actually going to end up at the same point. So I'm going to go ahead and bring them closer together and it actually looks like that's going to be the shape and length that I want. So I can go ahead and keep bringing them together. So the only time you want to be br bringing these together evenly at the same time is if they are meeting up and they're both centered. Otherwise they're not going to end up at the same point. Okay, so again, just bring them together. Now I'm not going to close it all the way down yet. I'm going to stop. I'm going to kind of scope it out and see what it looks like. I kind of like that look. Now I want to show you, see how it kind of looks kind of rigid? I want to show you something. Most of the other clasps that I've been showing you, so it has like a little, a more rounded section and then this little wave here. Again, this little wave. Now this one stays, this one has, I kept it rounded. There's no other texture. Whereas this one, I've actually put texture so it, it has a little flattened section here, which looks really nice. So in order to achieve that with this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put my um, wrap and tap plier back into that part of the clasp. I'm going to grab my, um, I'm going to grab my bent chain nose plier and I'm going to go ahead and bring those two together, which is going to give me a little bit more of an angled look here. Now after that, I'm going to take my bent nose plier I'm going to bring hold, holding just the tip of that clasp. Let me get it in there and then I'll show you what I'm doing. So you can see I'm just holding the tip of that clasp and then now I'm going to bring it upwards so it gives me that little dimension. Now I'm going to go ahead and put it back on the wrap and tap. So it's going to look like this. Again using the bent nose plier and bringing this down. going to give me, give me a better shape and a better look. Now again, I like the preference of hammering the edge here and so this is how I would do that. I would go ahead and place it on my bench block and then hammer that down. So you can see how it has a really clean finish. It's really smooth but it gives it some good texture. So if you look at it head on, it looks really clean all the way around. These make great handmade clasps for any project, by the way. I've actually had students make this hook and eye clasp and then uh, hole punch several pieces so they've made it into a multi-strand clasp. So this is a great, um, in its own right, the clasp part of this technique is a great um, technique to know. Okay, so this is our riveted bracelet that you've completed in class today. Good job. Um, just hope that you um, learned some really good techniques. I also want to show you some um, other design ideas to get, um, give you a different um, way to show you your creativity. And um, so stay tuned. So these are some, on top of the bracelet that you've just finished, um, these are some other um, samples that I've referred to. Um, in, throughout the construction of the bracelet. Um, this technique, it's really versatile and tech, um, riveting. I've found different types of pieces um, that have, have inspired me to rivet, um, like for example, these sterling silver donuts that I've riveted a bale on and then wire wrapped a gemstone on that. And then different ways to use blanks and some stamping and, and dapping techniques. These are actually some old coins. Um, this is a two pence, actually this is not old, it's a two pence from, from London that my friend brought back for me and I've hammered it and given it a really cool texture. It's a really thick piece, which actually I had to drill the hole through this because it was too, um, too deep or too thick for the metal hole, screw down metal hole punch to, to go through. Um, I've already talked about the old Bhutan coins from India that I've used. Um, it's just it, this technique of making your own clasps, um, I think it's great too because a lot of times when you make a project and you truly want it handmade but then you have like a manufactured lobster clasp or something like that, you're like, oh yes, everything's handmade except the clasp. So this is another way to incorporate um, you know, truly, a truly handmade piece from start to finish. And although sometimes it may have an ethnic feel to it, I'm sure that you will find great creative ways to make it a little bit more delicate and more appealing to maybe your style. So the, the whole concept of riveting is that everything has to fit really tight and snug. So the better 
um, prepared you are, the um, more detail-oriented you are in the very beginning steps um, from spiraling and making all the connections fit, the better the end result is going to be. So thanks for taking the Riveted Bracelet class. I hope to see you again on another education project. And aloha.